welcome to the If the Tomb is Empty book launch party. We are so excited that you're here. Yeah, give it up. We're excited. I know, this is fun, right? Crazy. We're so glad that you're here. My name's Allie. I'll be your host for tonight as we just talk about this book, what it means, how you wrote it, and where you can order it or buy it tonight. So another fun thing that we're going to do tonight is live questions. So at any point tonight, you can text, the number is going to be on the screen, you can text this number with a question about the book, is Pastor Joby going to write another book, anything, it's open. Uh, if you're joining us online, you can type in the chat box, either on YouTube or Facebook, and we will go into some fun Q&A a little bit later on. But here we are, Pastor Joby, you yes. wrote a book. This is my copy. It's full of highlights. I mean, I just, I couldn't put it down. It was, it's so good. So I'm so excited to talk about it. But first thing is first is that the important disclaimer, you are not related to each other. As far is as this you know. That's the question everyone's asking. Is, I think if it goes back far enough, there's probably some common distant ancestry. Distant cousins. But I no. claim him. He just doesn't claim me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so Pastor Joby, I've known you for a really long time. I was one of your students yeah, back you at Beach Church when you were the student pastor. You haven't changed a bit. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. Oh, you haven't changed. No, and you I haven't changed. I've, I've changed. changed a lot. I now have a baby, which is crazy. <laughs> I didn't have hour. one in student ministry. Um, <laughs> so you have been my pastor for over ten years, which is really crazy. And if there's one thing I know about you, it's that you fiercely love Jesus, and it's all over this book, like every page. It's about Jesus, which is a good thing. But there are some people joining us tonight who maybe have never even heard of your name, mm -hmm. and they might have just seen this title and thought, mm -hmm. I need to start believing that anything is possible, mm -hmm. so I'm going to join in. So can you just tell us, like, the 60-second version of who you are, Pastor Joby Martin? That's going to be really hard. <laughs> um, <clears throat> didn't grow up in church at all. Got in a little trouble. Found myself cutting grass at a Baptist summer camp and had heard of God and his love for us, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm from the South, and you know, everybody claims a church, claims to be a Christian. And my counselors at this camp reenacted the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah, and did. somehow I was transported from Bennettsville, South Carolina, to Jerusalem, AD 33. And when Jesus pushed up on his nail-pierced feet and said, it is finished, somehow I believe that counted for me. And I, I wouldn't use this terminology today, but I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and he did, and I've never gotten over it. So good. Yeah, man. And now you're a pastor of a church. Tell us a little more. You pastor a church here in Jacksonville, Florida. <clears throat> I do, yeah. So uh, invited back to that same camp a few years later as a staffer. This is the first time I ever preached a sermon or led a Bible study or any of that. And uh, Coach Lee, the guy that led me to the Lord, thought that I should go into ministry, and I assured him I would never, ever, ever work at a church. And then, Famous uh, last words. No doubt. <laughs> so I did student ministry for about 15 years, and then God allowed me to be a part of the team that planted what I think is the greatest church on the planet, not that it's a competition. Some people agree with you. <laughs> I love it here, man. This is so much fun to see all of you here and, and just to get to do this thing together. So and so a big part of the book, too, is uh, a bit of my story, how I came to Christ, and a lot of the story of our church and what God's been doing in us and through us and to us. And so, so good. That's it. Cool. Now, Charles, I don't know you super well, but here is what I know about you. A couple things. Your family is an incredible part of this church. You've written some books. A lot of books. Some are movies now. A couple. And you serve on our facilities team. I do. Taking out trash and cleaning up messes. We'll leave it at messes <laughs> at that. But tell us a little bit more about who you are. Um, born and raised here in Jacksonville. My mom is here somewhere. My mom and my sister. <laughs> All right. Um, Christy and I married 29, almost, yeah, 29 years ago. We have three boys all grown and out of the house. And in my spare time, I write books. Like 20 plus. Some really good ones that are in like New York Times lots bestsellers. of languages. Yeah, all the things. He's, like, he's helpful. Hey, my awesome. kids are here too, man. JP and Reagan are over there. They're probably the youngest people here. <laughs> Reagan sent me a text. She says, is this book thing fancy? And, Which, said, and she wore her Nikes because but I was like, you said yes. Have you yes. ever seen anything fancy at our church? <laughs> so, so wear whatever you want. Yes, for sure. And also, Charles, I recently heard you on Annie Down's podcast tour. And I heard you describe the man who first believed in you as a novelist as a man with presence. Like he, he was walking in the room and he just had presence. And I thought, 
That's funny because I feel like that's how everyone sees you. That's close to you at 1122. You're just a man with a lot of presence. I met, I was, Christy and I went to National Prayer Breakfast in D.C. and we ended up going to this dinner and I met Don Stevens who started and led as president Mercy Ships for a long time. And he asked me what I did at dinner that night. And at the moment when he asked me, I was unemployed. All I had was a manuscript and a drawer which Christy had read and she thought was good or as good as some of the stuff she reads in Barnes and Noble, but that's all I had. And he asked me what I did and I said, I'm a writer. That was the first time I'd ever, you Christy almost started it. laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the first time I ever said it. And then some neat, the Lord did some neat stuff and he asked me to write their story. So good. I don't know why, to this day, I don't know why I said it. I think I was desperate. I mean, really, you know. I, in desperation, I just think I said, well, I, I'm going to tell you my heart's desire. Hmm. So good. So now we, you've written this book together. Mm -hmm. What was the process like of writing it? And what were some of maybe your favorite moments or a moment that really stands out as you look back on writing this together? Well, it was way more than just like a writing project. Um, Charles and I share many loves. One is the gospel. A good one to have. Another one is to chase whitetails with a bow. And so <laughs> we've been hunting buddies for a while. And Charles is also a deacon here, like you mentioned. And, and so we've, we've known each other. We live in the same neighborhood. And um, I don't even know if I've told you this, man. As, as you know, if you're an 1122er, I lost one of my very best friends this year. And God putting Charles in my life at this season of my life, I think he was just he knew that there was gonna be an opening mm -hmm. and Charles had stepped into that spot. We're really, really, mm -hmm. we're brothers. Cool. Not brother brothers, but you know, <laughs> brother brothers. <clears throat> and so we would go up, we would, Friday morning, supposed to be my day off, we would go up to South Georgia, to Glorious Woodbine, Georgia, and we would climb up in a tree and chase animals to the glory of God and then <laughs> go sit in our retreat center that our church owns and build a big old fire and Charles would help me take the content that God has given me through teaching his word for a long time and help me take it from stage to page, mm. you know? Good. And um, especially in a world with so much skepticism and uh, around ghost writers and all that thing, it, it, it was really important for me for the cover to say, I mean, you know, I feel like God gave me the content, but it was written by me but with, with Charles. Sure. And he helped me like crazy. And then, um, if you read a couple of his nonfiction books, What If It's True and They Turn the World Upside Down, it's, it's evident that he has been an attender of 1122 for years and years and years and years, because there was a bunch of my stuff that just came through. <laughs> right. Oh, I, out. I stole it, absolutely. <laughs> but not like that, it's just. <clears throat> <laughs> if I'm gonna sit there, I'm stealing it. Yeah, absolutely. But it was so honoring. I mean, he lives like, I don't know, he lives just around the corner. So when I was reading those books, it was what an honor to me, man, that this guy, this incredible writer, influencer in our world, and that, you know, the, the preaching under which he sat for a bunch of years was impacting him. So when it came time for me to write a book, I always said when people would ask, when are you going to write a book? I thought, well, you know, you only get your first one once, so I want to wait till I have something to say. And I, and I felt like... This message, if the tomb is empty, was something that I wanted to say, totally. but I needed help. And, and God put Charles in my life for us to do this thing together. So cool. Charles, what were some of your favorite moments or a moment from writing this book that stands out to you? I'd have to say it was probably the tavern at the retreat center because we would get in there and, and Joby would, would teach this stuff to me. And... I mean, when we got in there, we, a lot of times it was cold, we'd light a fire, and we felt like we were somehow connected to history or something. It was really cool. It's a neat, to, even to this day, I think that, that space holds a neat place in our hearts. We can't walk by the table without thinking, yeah, we wrote that right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to quantify this, but I do know that when we would sit down and he would start teaching and I would start, you know, kind of ruminating on what, how do we how do we translate that into story and book and I'd begin asking questions and different things would bubble up it was like we could I don't want to totally over spiritualize it but we could feel the presence of God fall and we shed a lot of tears no 
writing this thing. And I had then and I have now, and we've prayed it and we will continue to pray it, but the Lord is in this book like powerfully. And we sensed that. And I, like I'm, I was excited about it then, I'm excited about it now, but like we felt the Lord show up. Mm-hmm. Like, like not just, I'm not just blowing snow because like y'all are doing this, but like we felt the Lord show up. And to me, that was, to me, that said the Lord is in this, and we should be doing this. So good. So you kind of mentioned, Pastor Joby, that people would ask you, when are you going to write a book? <clears throat> so why this book, and specifically why now, I think is really important. So over the last, <clears throat> particularly the last two years, but over the last 25 years or so, as a pastor, I find myself having conversations with folks at our church, and they find themselves in impossible situations. And they would say things like, can you pray for me, I'm in an impossible marriage, or my my financial situation is impossible and I don't know what to do. And then I would say, well, are you a believer? Uh Uh-huh, don't you believe that Christ came out of the grave? And they'd be like, I do. And then one day, it just fell out of my mouth. Well, if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. And so particularly what what all folks have been through in the last couple of years, I think they need to hear this. And what we do in the book is we start with Mount Moriah and we trace through seven mountains and we end up on Mount Calvary, which is also the same mountain. Very few Christians even know that to be true. And And we see how all of this points towards an empty tomb. Because if the resurrection doesn't happen, man, we're just wasting our time. And on that mountain holds a grave that could not hold a body, and that's what we are aiming at. And if that tomb is empty, then the sa- if you're a believer in Jesus, then the same power that resurrected from Christ from the grave lives in us, and he can breathe new life into your marriage, and he can breathe reconciliation into any broken relationship, and if he spoke into existence everything that is, then surely he can handle your financial Amen. situation. And that's not even the point. The point is that you would know the resurrected Christ. Amen, so good. <laughs> And I love, I love that it feels like every chapter, that, it's right, the centrality of everything points to Jesus on the cross and then the empty grave. And it's from the beginning. And each mountain that you walk through, you connect those two things, which I think is really important and revolutionary for many of us that we didn't make that connection growing up. We separated the Old Testament from the New mm-hmm. Testament. and connecting all of these things and stringing the line from cover to cover matters so much to so many people who feel like they've known this forever and then you read this and you're like, I had no idea. Yeah. Jesus was the point the whole time. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> um, so what do both of you hope for the people that read this? What do you want them? You talked a little bit about it, you know. Hope, again, believing something's possible, but what do you hope that people feel or get from this? One of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I felt like God did to us as we were working on this. You know, Jesus makes this promise in John 15. He says, if you'll draw near to me, I will draw near to you. That's James 4. But in in John 15, he says, abide in me and I will abide in you. And so the process that we went through is we just opened his word and dug in and, and we're, and we're just trying to lift Christ up. And as we did, even in the process, he drew us closer and closer to him. Like Charles said, man, we cried and cried and prayed and we prayed for miracles and for lost people to be saved. And, you know, Charles, like I said, has been attending this church for so long. When I would be teaching something, he would say, tell me the one about when your dad saved the dog, whatever the story was. And <clears throat> we would walk through that stuff. And I'm telling you, even if nobody, even a book, even if a book did not come out of this, God used that time in my life to draw nearer and nearer to him. So all I wanna do with my life is help people discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I did not write a book for my name or fame. I mean, boy, my, my English teachers would be, <laughs> they would say, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible, because this guy. <clears throat> you should send them a copy. But I, I'll, I'll do that. Um, I won't, I believe they're gonna be there are gonna be men sitting in cell blocks that we right. get a copy to and they're gonna meet Jesus. And there are gonna right. be people 
sitting in the hospital on a chemo drip, and they're gonna grow deeper in their relationship with Jesus. Because what we learn as you study these mountains is God often demonstrates his glory on the mountaintop experience, and he shows his grace and mercy down in the valley. And every single one of us are either up there, down there, or somewhere in between. And so that's who this book's for. So good. Charles, anything you would add? What do you hope people get out of this book? He talked about the stories. One of the cool things is, I mean, I've, I've been here a couple of years now, so I've heard, you know, either just spending time with him, the two of us, or here listening, I've heard a bunch of the stories. So it was really cool as we're sitting there working. One of my prayers was, like I've written, I've published over two million of my own words. So my voice, it's kind of like, Natural. I mean, when I sit down to write, it sounds like me. And my prayer was, Lord, because I've had a lot of people ask me to write their books, and I've never said yes until Joby. Part of that was because I didn't know if I could, number one, I didn't find anybody whose book I wanted to write, but two is I didn't know if I could take my voice and set it aside and write a book that was, that was an accurate reflection of that person's voice, and like they stayed them. And it was really a neat thing I felt like the Lord did in me that it, as soon as we sat down to work, it was like I just found a gear or a something and he sounds like him. Even when I read it, I think it sounds like him. 100%. I actually told Pastor Joey this earlier today that I loved reading it. I felt like I could literally hear him saying these words. There's even one sentence that says, so I drove out the drive. And I was like... <laughs> This is a Pastor Joby sentence. I'm like, I don't know what this means. I think it means I drove out of the driveway in Dylan. You should have talk. seen the comments that our first editor got back to us. She was oh, not happy. Goodness. But the thing she that was, like New York too. No, was like, the, yeah. the, the, it was, the it editor's awesome. comments like could be a book in themselves. But the thing that we learned as <laughs> I'm sitting there listening to him is that the Holy Spirit, like he'd be speaking and the Holy Spirit would like drop a thing in me and I would think about, oh, that sounds like the story and maybe he should tell that. So I started keeping this running tally of stories. So in my world, I was working on two books. I was working on If the Tomb is Empty, and then I had this, this, this document with all these stories. And part of the fun was trying to figure out where, where do these drop in? Because I, I had a feeling like there are gonna be people who look at him and study him and wanna know how this got like here and who he is and wanna know his story. And we were able to sort of weave the teaching, this story, with his story, and I think it does it seamlessly, and there'll be people who wanna, who wanna get that out of the book. So in a sense, you're almost kinda getting two stories. Absolutely, it's so good. Okay, so we're gonna give a, a couple little teaser questions, because I know everyone's dying to know, okay, what's actually in this book? We're hearing all about it. So mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about some of the things actually in it. We're not, no spoilers, but the tomb ends up being empty. <laughs> so you mentioned this. And there's a sequel, he's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, so the book is structured around seven significant mountains from the Bible, seven chapters. Each chapter covers one of the mountains. What is your favorite mountain and why? If you don't say Calvary, you're not even a Christian. It's got to be. Well, sure. <laughs> Calvary is my favorite mountain, and I've been there. Yes. <clears throat> my favorite one to teach is the Mountain of Transfiguration. Um... And not because of what happens up on the Mount of Transfiguration, but because of what happens down in the valley. And oftentimes we, especially church folk, we can get addicted to this experience, you know? Us 1122ers come to saturate and we're like, we should do this all the time and just live here and you get a <laughs> cot and you get a cot and you get a cot and we'll all stay. It'd be pretty fun. Walking. It'd be, but God didn't create us to sit and be saturated up on the mountain. He sends us down in the valley because that's where the dad with the sick son lives. And that's what we're set into. That's right. That's my favorite one to teach. You have to pick a different one. <laughs> <clears throat> no, you can't. I mean, well, if you pick, if you pick Mariah, you also get Calvary. There so I'll, I'll a pick Mariah. Two for one situation. <laughs> but yeah, I love the way that you get to start at Mariah, Abraham and Isaac, come full circle, Jesus, and you see that the Father sacrifices His Son. It's a, I love the way it came together. So chapter one is Mount Sinai. The people of Israel have just escaped from the Egyptians. They're free from slavery. The Red Sea's parted. They're like, we're free. They're probably thinking, we got this, promised land. 
but then they, he leads them into the desert. Mm -hmm. And you talk a little bit about desert seasons, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. You look at your life, and as a Christian, sometimes you can feel like, am I allowed to have desert seasons? So can you talk about why do we have desert seasons? What, what is the Lord teaching us through those? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, J.I. Packer says it this way. I won't get this quote exactly right, but he says, and still he seeks the fellowship of his people. And he will bring us both joy or sorrow to detach our hands from the things of this world that we might attach ourselves to him. God has no problem disrupting us, disrupting our comfort, disrupting our lives, so as to fix our eyes on him. And it's because of his love and grace that he does so. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter one says it would be God's wrath that he would give us everything that we wanted. Mm -hmm. But it's because of his kindness that he convicts us and has no problem with us walking around and wandering in the desert to burn off all the idolatry in our lives so that we can then receive the blessings that he has for us. Sure, that's good. Okay, one last question for me and then we're gonna go to our live Q&A. So if you have a question or maybe one has been sparked, you can still text it in. I think we can show the number on the screen uh, or you can submit it to the chat. But one last question before we go there. You talk around in the book and you talk about it all the time. You never get over the gospel. You even, talk, even as you're writing it, you're sitting there weeping, just overwhelmed by God's love. What do both of you do to stir your affections, what we would say in the church, or what do you, both of you do to never get over the gospel? <clears throat> I, I've said it a lot, but <clears throat> one of the greatest ways to deepen your relationship with Jesus is put yourself in a place to help other people discover theirs. I should not be sitting up here. There's no way, man. And I, I just can't get over that God would use me. I can't get over that he saved me. Mm. I mean, if all he did is save me and then kill me one second later and take me home, that's still the super mole, man. I mean, I've won it all. And then he would redeem me, call me unto himself, give me this incredible family, and then I get to, for all of my days, be used by him to be with our church, to help people surrender to Jesus and then walk with him all the days of our life. I don't know how you get over that, man. I just don't, I mean, that, that, that he, he took my place. I just can't get over it. I just can't get over it. So good. What about for you, Charles? If you, if you move into Revelation and you read, I don't pretend to understand all of Revelation, but I know that when I read it, there's a throne room, and in the throne room, there's one who sits on the throne. His eyes are fl flames of fire, and there's a sword from his mouth, and his hair is white, and he's got his name written on his thigh, and a sword coming out of his mouth, and his feet are burnished bronze. And there are all these thrones around him, and everybody with the throne is on their face, and they've cast their crowns at his feet, and all the, the heavenly host, Daniel says it's 10,000 times 10,000. It's like the largest number he can possibly think of. They're all singing, and, and that, that one who's there, that Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, bright morning star, king of glory, king of kings, for some reason, Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, leaves that and comes on a prisoner swap. And I'm, I'm not worth that. And yet he does it. It's inconceivable to me. Guys, we're all getting all emotional up here. <laughs> oh, <it> man. <clears throat> yeah, this is probably inappropriate, but we would laugh all the time after we would cry together right in the chapter and be like, we know how to put the men in menopause. Let me tell you that. <laughs> With good grace, there's some hormonals going on here. <clears throat> Which I do want to say, man, like, when your church grows fast, every, they all want you to write a book, and I wanted to wait until just the right time. And I also was right, waiting for just the right person. Mm. And I was more concerned about putting together a tool that would help disciple people than I was how big my name was on this thing. Sure. And so I'm so grateful that Charles would, would say yes and we could join together in this gospel work and do For this sure. thing together. For sure. Y'all want to read this book yet? This is going to be you guys be crying reading this book. So before we get into the Q&A here, I'm going to tell you how you can get yourself a book. You can pre-order at coe22.com slash books and there's tons of resources that are going to be on that page. There's a study guide that's incredible that goes with the book. 
Um, and so check that out, pre-order at coe22.com slash books. And then after you've read it and run out of highlighter ink and cried your face off, then you can leave a review on Goodreads or Amazon so other people can be discipled through it. Again, it's not about Pastor Joby's name or the Church of 1122. It's about helping people discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus. So, all right, we're going to get into the, the Q&A. You all ready? Okay. Ooh, this is a good one. What strength did each of the writers bring to the project, and what weakness did you cover for each other? The idea of me sitting down in some cabin and pecking away 200 pages <laughs> would be a weakness of mine. <laughs> That's what we're calling it. But I, I mean, I said it for years, man. I think when I preach, you know, it's moderately delivered and exceptionally received. I don't know why the Lord has decided to use the, the way I teach it to impact people's lives, but it's, sometimes it's easier to hand somebody this than it is necessarily to be like, hey, listen to this sermon, you know? And <clears throat> we put it together, too, in such a way that, yeah, man, if there's somebody going through kid pain, you just say, just read the chapter on the Mountain of Transfiguration, totally. you know? If there's somebody bound mm. up in religiosity, just read the chapter on Sinai. That's good. You know, that's, so we put it together that way. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the strength, I guess, would be the content for me, but the weakness yeah. would be typing. <laughs> typing. <laughs> <laughs> what about for you, Charles? <clears throat> strength for me would probably be stringing the stories together and trying to figure out um, you know, how, how it ought to be put together. Because Joby's phenomenal with the content. But he's just like, you know, he, he sorry, but he can kind of just vomit the com content to me. <laughs> and then I'm sort of like stuck with this bucket. What do I do with all this? <laughs> and so we had to figure out how do we organize it. And <clears throat> you had to the, figure out how we organize part it. Part of the fun, too, was figuring out what are we going to call this thing. Oh, yeah. And we were tossing, we were doing, you know, titles on napkins and everything. And I just, I don't know, I said to Christy one day, I said, and I'm not taking credit for the, but it, this is what, how it came up. I think we ought to pick something that's like his signature phrase. And for, that was simple. It was if the tomb is empty because all of you can finish that. Right. Like, I, I, you, even if we meet in the supermarket and you don't know me and I say, if the tomb is empty and you've been here, you're going to go, well, then anything's possible. And that's his, sure. that's like, I think that's what he's known for. So weakness for me would be trying to stay in a place where I don't superimpose my voice over his. Mm. I mean, you know, like, that could be if I, if, I, if I lose sight of what we're doing. All right, this question is from Reagan, your daughter. <laughs> but it's not for you, it's for Charles. Okay, great. <laughs> what has been your favorite novel to write and why? I love that girl. For those of you who have not read my books, I have written up like 16 novels and they're good and you should read them. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yes, for sure. And Reagan, you're now my favorite girl in this church. I just want you to know that. <laughs> um, I don't, folks have asked me that a lot and it's like you might as well line up our boys, Charlie, John T. and Reeves and say, who do you love the most? Depending upon the day of the week, I can answer that. But each of, those, each of those stories I wrote from a place and I was dealing with something. So, like, I don't ever write in third gear. I, I, like, I write with all of me. It's every one I pour myself out on the page. So it's not like I'm holding something back. Mm -hmm. I don't have one where I said, yeah, I put more into that one. Or th they're all, all that I have. I don't, I don't have a favorite. I have, I have characters that are my favorite. I have moments that are my favorites. I think this Keeper series that I've just finished is pretty fun. Um, but I don't have a favorite. I okay. mean, I, even if you back me up into my first one, I still look at that and I still read it and I think, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't change people to ask me, do you want to edit your books now that you're you know, a different writer and you're 20 years in? I wouldn't. Because they were perfect for the time. They were all I could do. Yeah. It was the best I had. That's good. Okay, this is for you, Pastor Joby. This is from Patty. Could Pastor Joby elaborate why he wouldn't use the term asking Jesus into your heart? I grew up Baptist, and that's the terminology we used. What's new and changed? <clears throat> What's new and changed is that God is the initiator in your salvation, not you. That we are saved by grace through faith, and the faith that we have is even a gift, gift from God. That's why we can't boast about it. 
So the, I would rather say surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, the Christ sitting on the throne with the flaming eyes and the white hair and the sword out of his mouth, it's not like you're inviting him to do anything. You are receiving mm. that gospel Im- invitation, but that's just different. And you're not just asking him to come into your heart you're asking him to invade every single bit of your that's entire good. life. That's right. And so that, that's the difference. It's good. It's a great way to explain it to a child. Right. But at some point, you should put childish ways behind you. All right. So you've preached these sermons before, or these, this content, and we're doing a series mm-hmm. in line with the book. So if you've listened to the sermons in the past, how will reading the book impact someone? <clears throat> well, like Charles said, there's a whole bunch of the story of our church, that my story, um, and then also the moment we begin to call it if the tomb is empty, then while we are going from mountain to mountain to mountain, mountains isn't really the thing that strings the whole thing together. It's really the gospel from Abraham through, through the gospels. This is a good one. This is going to be hard. Charles will answer it then. Okay. <laughs> As you were called to write this book, what obstacles did you encounter and how did you overcome them? Any whispers during this process? Yeah, I mean, I suffer from the whispers bad. And if you, if you are new around here, the enemy is a liar. And he loves to try to get you to identify yourself by your scars and your past and right. who do you think you are and all of those kind of what if everybody hates it and, you know, just da, 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 da. And so this is why we have to consistently just preach the gospel to ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's why I spent a significant portion of a chapter explaining what propitiation is. That Je- This is love. Not that we love him, but he loved us and sent his son as the propitiation for our sin. And propitiation means a payment that satisfies, which means if Jesus fully and, sati- fully and finally satisfied the justice of God, the wrath of God, the law of God, and I am in Christ, then God the Father cannot be dissatisfied in me. And that then is the foundation by which I can take steps of faith and obedience because God can't be disappointed in me. He delights over me, his son. He looks at me before my name is ever on a book and says, behold my son in whom I am well pleased. Mm, that's right. And you might say, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't he say that about Jesus? Yep. And then Jesus says, if I put my faith in him, I am in him and a co-heir with every promise and every blessing that is his. That's good. It's funny. You said propitiation, and I heard the s of payment that satisfies. Right. Because <clears throat> you're... Our church knows these words, these crazy theological words sure. that a lot of us did not grow up hearing. And it was, that was just a very cool moment. I'm like, here, everyone's like, the payment, that's us. <laughs> They're like answering them. Good. It was great. Well done. <laughs> okay, is there going to be a live audio of the book? I don't know what live audio is, but is there going to be an there audio? There is, yeah, the book, is, yeah. I, I recorded the audible for the book. Very fun. And thank you, our team. We did it right here because we have all of yes. the <coughs> cool. equipment, etc. It's awesome. All right, this is a question for you, Charles. Pastor Joby mentions that C.S. Lewis is one of his favorite authors. Who is a writer that you admire? I grew up on Louis L'Amour. Uh, I read Tolkien before Peter Jackson made him famous. I, I, I read Lewis, but I probably didn't fall in love with Lewis until graduate school. I mostly read comic books as a kid. I read a bunch of stuff in college and grad school, but if you press me, and I've said this before, because I work all day or I spend a lot of my day working and writing, by the time I get to night, my eyes are tired, and I don't really feel like reading. But I will read scripture, and if I have to, if if there's one person that speaks what my heart wishes it could put words to, it'd be David, Mm. period. Good. I love this question. I feel like maybe my husband sent this in. From how long from the first word to the end? How long is the book? <laughs> it's 200 and something pages. I don't know. You're going to need to give it a minute. This is going to determine whether or not they get this book. 248 pages. All right. Hopefully that person's in. Maybe 250 was their threshold. They're like, we got him. 
Yeah, when I got the author's copy, I sent a picture to my dad, and he just texted back, who'd have thunk it? <laughs> Probably the same person that said, drove out the drive, taught That's you it. that, that yeah. phrase. Um, do we have more books in the future? Yeah, we're working on number two right now. Okay. I'm, I'm editing number two. Waste right no now. time. <clears throat> yeah. Get after it. Can you give us a little hint about what it's going to be or it's, we're going to say that? Oh, no problem. The current working title is Because the Tomb is Empty. Yeah, yeah so that. we're going to talk about, we're, it, it's really geared for people that need a miracle in their life. Mm. And oftentimes, man, oftentimes, God's miracle could just be on the other, other side of a step of obedience that we need to take. And then we'll, we will, instead of looking at seven mountains, we will look, look at a bunch of different miracles in the scriptures. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea of when this will be coming out? About this time next year-ish. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, done. the Lord willing, I would love to do this over and over and over and over. Um, like I said before, because of what the, the process, it was like a two-man disciple group, for, at least for me. <laughs> no, you know? it was for me, totally. I mean, it, it was really great. So and as long as it's helpful for folks, as long as it helps people grow in their relationship with Jesus, then right. I, I'd be happy to keep doing it. It's awesome. All right, last question before we close out our time together. How are you closer to the Lord through the writing of this book? <clears throat> well, like I said, James, the brother of Jesus, gives us this incredible promise from God. In James 4, 8, he says, this is an invitation to every single one of us. He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. And so there are more than 100 hours where we are digging into the word, telling a lot, of, a lot of my life, just being vulnerable about the places where I have questions and doubts and those kinds of things. But all of it was just me leaning in to God. And what's incredible about that promise, man, when I think about that promise in James, I, I think about the, <clears throat> I don't know exactly how it works, but the, the computer system by which the pilot of a 777 drives that thing. All he does is barely move his wrists and all of that jet engine and people and luggage and power and energy turns. And he gives us this invitation. If you'll just lean into me just a little bit, I will grab on to your life and do exceedingly more in you and through you than you would ever hope or imagine. So I would just en encourage you, man, just open the word, lean into yeah. him. Good. Put yourselves in positions where you're helping other people discover their relationship with Jesus and then watch how God deepens yours. So good. Charles, what about for you? Well, then, you know, after we'd get together, I'd go home and I'd take all this stuff and kind of put it together and I'd spend, you know, I'd spend six or eight hours at my desk trying to figure out how to put this into a chapter or, you know, a paragraph or what, I don't know, whatever. And it, like every day, I mean, he teaches verse by verse, so every day, I'm literally just in the Word. I mean, I've got our notes and whatnot here. I've got the Word here. And I'm spending six or eight hours kind of just in the Word. And, I, you know, I loved it. I, I loved everything about it. It was, it was the most, some of the most fun I've had in writing in a long time. I mean, I love what I do. I, I love that the Lord lets me do what I get to do. And I'm really glad He let me do this. For sure. It was, it, it ministered to me in a lot of places that I needed it at the time. I loved our time together. You feel like he preaches to you. I got to sit in a room with him and he would preach to me and I would ask him stuff. And so my understanding of the word, I felt like it was just magnified. So good. Well, we are all so glad that you wrote this book, truly. Are we excited? Come on. We're so excited. So kind. And it's just so cool to hear and watch the journey of this book, and it feels so special now. We're, we're so close to the release date next week, and then we're going to preach the series, and Easter's coming, and it's all very exciting. And we know that when we give just a little, God multiplies it. And so yeah. we're so excited to see what the Lord does with this book and the life of our church and the life of people who have never heard the name Pastor Joey Martin, and they're going to get a hold of this book. Someone's going to give it to them, and they, too, might be saved. So before we close out our time, let's spend some time in prayer. Charles, would you mind praying for this book and the life of it and those that are going to read it? I can do it. All right, if you have one of these, let's just hold it out as like an offering to the Lord.
Lord Jesus, we are grateful to you that you would allow us, and I say that, I say that, Lord, like I'm grateful that you allowed me to be a part of this. But we give it to you, Father. Your word says that unless, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it will have no life in it. So tonight, sort of in some spiritual way, we take this thing and we lay it on your altar and we, we just bury it as a, as a gift. And we ask, Father, that the thing that would come out of the ground would be just substantially different than the thing that's put in, that, that it would take on a life of its own, not for us, but for your glory. And Lord, we pray for the hands that this will fall into for the people, whether in, they're in cell block B or they're in first class at 35,000 feet or, or you know, a mom in the carpool line or I, I don't know, whoever's gonna get this, Father, would you even now like breathe the Ruach of God into this thing and into their hands and into their life and would you meet them where they need to be met? Would you break chains? Would you bring freedom? Would you loose them? Holy Spirit, we ask that you would fill it, that you would go before it. We ask that you would take it to every country in the world because your gospel needs to be heard. So Father, tonight in the name of Jesus, we bless this book and we bless this story and we, we bless Joby. We pray that you would go before him and that you would go before this, that you would have your way with it. And Father, we look forward to the day that we all walk through the, <laughs> the gates and we meet people who are there because somehow or another they cracked these pages yeah. and you met them. In Jesus' name. Amen.